Um, so you should be you should receive a notification saying that I'm recording it. Um, and then I'll do another quick <laughs> quick intro for the video and then we'll get started. So again, welcome everyone. Thank you, James, for joining us um, to, to discuss your book. I'm Emily Harmer, one of the co-conveners of the group, um, and I'll be sort of chairing today's session. So I want to give James as, uh, the, as much time to talk as possible, so I'm going to let you go ahead and share your slides, which I'll just need to enable on here, and then feel free to kick us off with an overview of the book. Okay, so hopefully you can see this now. Let me just... Uh... Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much for inviting me to do this. Uh, it's very nice to see everyone, also see some familiar faces and names. Um, so um, I wasn't gonna do any slides today. Uh, I thought let's just shoot from the hip and um, sort of just briefly introduce it, um, the book and give an overview of it. But then yesterday morning, I had a rare couple of, very rare at this time of year, rare couple of hours to sort of um, have a bit of a think um, about um, some of the, aspects of the books that I, I, that book that I wanted to introduce. And it sort of occurred to me, particularly as I'm going to be doing a paper related to it later in the year, hopefully at the MPG, that it might be worth having a few slides to just to sort of give a brief overview or an overview of some of the methodological and empirical aspects of the book, because there's quite a lot of research went into it. Um, so that's what I'll do to start with. But briefly, as you'll as you'll have gathered from the title of the book, um, it's, it's about interrogating, and to use that horrible, ugly word, problematizing the term left behind, the whole kind of discourse and narrative that's emerged, particularly in the last few years, in the shadow of Brexit and the immediate run-up to Brexit. Um, uh, the, the discourse of left behind Britain or left behind, particularly post-industrial communities and groups. Um, and sort of take, try to take that language apart and the kind of the surrounding discourse apart to kind of look at um, um, how it relates, which I tried to do in the first couple of um, chapters of the book, to changes, real world transformations in sort of working class and other wider class formations over time, particularly since the post-war periods, but also to, to historical discourses um, including often quite stigmatizing and, ne and negative ones about working class communities, the working class as a whole, and indeed poverty and, and social inequality. So um, that was the sort of starting point of the book, you know, recognizing that there was this, this terminology that had become kind of common currency in the media and politics, particularly in the immediate run up to and aftermath of the referendum. But it's obviously continued to this day through the, the debates around leveling up and the red wall in 2019 and so forth. Um, and uh, to try to take the terminology apart, look at it for, for what it um, what it actually, as, as I did through the empirical work that I'm about to talk about, what it, how it actually has been presented in media and political discourse over the last few years, um, but also um, some of the kind of connotations that perhaps some of that presentation um, disguises, however thinly, um, and uh, some of the wider societal issues that, that are obscured by a lot of that, that discourse, um, and particularly other groups in society besides the post-industrial, inverted commas, white working class, that are often left out of traditional left behind discourses, um, but perhaps have as much, if not a greater claim to being considered economically, at least left behind, uh, if we're to use that terminology, as, as, as the post-industrial white working class. Um, anyway, so just to quickly go over, I promised Emily I was going to take long and I was going to rattle through these slides, but I can see already I'm only on slide one. So you probably had a chance to already, re uh, there was no cover slide, so uh, to, to look at that. So the, broadly speaking, three core strands to the empirical work went into the book. So to the once I got beyond the first couple of chapters that contextualized things and looked at the evolution of this uh, discourse historically, um, the next few chapters uh, present various empirical strands. So um, there was a framing analysis and selective um, critical discourse analysis of press articles from Lexis and Hansard debates or extracts from Hansard debates about or heavily mentioning the concept of the left behind or left behind groups um, around um, obviously not every single edition of every newspaper was looked at over the last over, over that um, 
um, three, four year period between June 2016 and December 2019. So I, I, I kind of clustered it around key discursive events. Um, and um, you'll see those on, a, on, I'm gonna show a sort of line graph in a minute, which shows what those key, those key events were in a minute. Um, the next stage was there was some social media analysis that I did, which was clustered around um, two of those key events, one of which was the, the night um, of the 2016 referendum, the night that all of the, the, the results started to unfold and the night of the 2019 election. Um, and I looked at, in terms of the, the um, comment threads that I looked at, I looked at the comment threads that were published beneath the main articles published by those newspapers that, that unpacked the results the following day or over the following 24 hour period. So these were the main articles about the outcome of the 2016 referendum, the 2019 election that carried comment threads beneath them effectively. Obviously, again, I didn't sample every single post, but um, the first X number of pages of posts, uh, the details of which are in the book, obviously, can't remember off the top of my head how many pages, but quite a lot of posts. Uh, and I also looked at Twitter. Uh, I sampled Twitter around uh, overnight or around those two events, obviously retrospectively, uh, retrospectively using an advanced Twitter search. Um, and the third strand, a very qualitative strand, was semi-structured interviews that I carried out with 50 plus representatives of, if you like, left behind communities. Um, you know, I think just assume I've got my inverted uh, inverted commas fingers up the whole time, every time I use the term left behind from now on. Um, so, my entry point for this actually was that I did cluster interviews around geographical areas of England and Wales um, initially that, that have customarily been, been labelled left behind in media and political discourse. So there were interviews carried out, for example, in the Great Yarmouth area on the east coast of Stoke-on-Trent. Um, a lot of these were also Brexit voting, though that wasn't the primary focus. It was uh, the starting point was a report by the local trust published in early 2020, which focused on identifying the attributes that were seen to make up, to constitute what uh, a, a left behind community looked like or left behind area. So my entry point to, um, to, to start contacting people for interview was to go to geographic, geographical clusters. There was the Rhonda Valley in Wales, for example, as well. Um, but, um, Within those clusters, I tried to be as varied as possible with the kind of groups and the communities that, that I approached for interviews. So I tried to not just approach classic white working class um, uh, individuals, although obviously some of the people I interviewed would have broadly fallen within that demographic, if you like. Um, parish councillors, local business owners, etc., but also through gatekeepers, like local community groups, I tried to get to some actual individuals who might have been otherwise harder to reach, if you like. So I did speak to people who are long-term unemployed, who have disabilities and so forth. But I also tried to be more multicultural than that. So recognizing the actual reality of a lot of post-industrial communities, contrary to sort of white working class, rather homogenous stereotype, I, I went out of my way to contact groups representing other ethnic communities within some of those areas or in, in the wider geographical areas uh, nearby. Um, and I also um, got a bit of funding towards the end for a small project that I did in Scotland, which is often left out of the wider UK wide left behind conversation, although there's many post industrial impoverished areas, of course, in Scotland. And um, through that project, um, which involved 20 interviews over a period of a year um, in the first year of COVID, um, I, I managed through um, various charities working with disabled groups and um, migrants and refugees and with people experiencing poverty generally. I managed to, to get quite a diverse group of people for interviews there. And some of that interview material, though it was done ostensibly for a, a separate project, some of that made it into um, the, the final sample that was, used, that was, you know, some of the quotes that were used in this book as well. So Scotland is also represented there in the end. Um, so my discursive events for the framing analysis, just to quickly go through them, I knew I was going to take longer than that. <laughs> here we go. So the 23rd of June to the 22nd, uh, three month period here, um, two month period, 26th, the 2nd of August, 2016. This is a period encompassing Brexit referendum, David Cameron's resignation, Theresa May's election, failed coup against Jeremy Corbyn. So a massive earthquake around, around Brexit itself, the, the vote at least. 29th of March to 28th of June, 2017. That's the period during which uh, Article 50 was activated. 
The snap election was called in 2017, and of course it took place and May lost a majority. Um, 4th of December 2018 to the 3rd of February 2019, uh, that was the big period during which Theresa May was trying to get her, her version of the withdrawal agreement through Parliament. If you meant, remember, it went to the death just before Christmas, and she failed, she just had to give up over the Christmas period. In the end, ended up facing not one but two confidence votes in the ensuing weeks as well during that period. And then there's uh, the penultimate period there, is a period in 2019 during which the Brexit party was formed. The final UK vote in a European parliamentary election was held and Farage's short-lived new party triumphed. Uh, and finally, there's that fateful period towards the end of 2019 where the one-line bill sets in motion the so-called Brexit election, as Sky News dubbed it throughout the period. Uh, the discourse of the Red Wall became popularised. It was only coined by Jane, James Canagrazorium, um, an ex-Tory pollster, a few months earlier that year, but it became common currency during that time. And of course, the discourse of levelling up was born as well, because that was, along with getting Brexit done, it was a key part of the, the Johnson shtick in the run up to that election. Um, so just to show you um, a bit of a visual illustration, there aren't any line graphs in the book. I was saying to Emily earlier, but actually it might have helped in some ways. So in terms of the press portrayals, um, um, you can see the snapshots at the bottom, but over the period, you can see the economic definitions of the left behind were overwhelmingly dominant uh, throughout the period. Um, but there is a strong kind of cultural uh, dimension as well, which gathers traction later on in the period. You know, um, in, early on, it's not such a big thing, the kind of cultural war discourse, if you like, but it builds up steadily. And by um, Early, uh, late 2018, early 2019, the culture war discourse, particularly in the right wing press, has become quite prominent. It falls back after that, but then gradually builds again. Uh, that's the orangey red line towards the 2019 election. Um, so on the whole, the press, despite what you might think, does take a broadly um, economistic sort of view of the, the left behind. It's deindustrialized communities primarily and so forth. Um, but there is there, there, there was a noticeable increase in the sort of culture war discourse in the press at various points, you know, kind of peaks and troughs there. There's also, of course, the political dimension, the idea of political marginalisation by distant elites and so on, which was um, probably more prominent really initially, perhaps unsurprisingly, around the point of the referendum itself, but fell back for a while and then kind of climbed back at various points and various hybrid um, iterations of the left behind, which kind of combined two or more of these elements. Um, now, the sentiment analysis, just to quickly go through it, what I looked at with this when I was looking at Twitter and comment threads around the Brexit vote itself and the 2019 election um, was um, not so much trying to look at how um, the left behind was being framed in, sense of, in, in um, people's social media posts and their tweets, but really what their attitudes um, seem to be towards groups identified as left behind. Sometimes, obviously, other, other terminology is used as sort of almost a proxy or a synonym for left behind. So white working class is often trotted out, for example, and, and so forth. Um, so it, it's, I initially immersed myself in these data sets and thought, should I just code it in the same sort of way that I did with the newspaper articles? Or is it something else that seems to be coming out of this, which is interesting? And actually it seemed to me that the attitudes towards people of the public or the self-selecting members of the public who choose to post um, were the things that were most interesting from this much smaller on the whole, comment threads relatively extensive, but, but on the whole compared to the articles that I looked at, so sort of rather smaller data set. Um, so I only conducted it for those two events. Um, the framing of newspaper articles in terms of the boat below the line comments on comment threads, um, as perhaps unsurprisingly, it seemed to exert quite a strong priming effect on the kinds of responses that were generated on comment threads from those who chose to post. So you tended to find if you had, for example, in The Guardian, um, the main article that had a comment thread beneath it on the night of uh, the Brexit referendum was by Matthew Goodwin, and it was focusing on Labour having let down the traditional working class, a familiar kind of narrative now, of course, um, and their kind of increasingly large scale migration away from the Labour Party towards other parties or to non-voting positions and so forth. Um, 
And even though this was the Brexit referendum, it wasn't a general election, it was being pra- framed very much in that way. And, and, you know, the liberal establishment generally having left behind the working class. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, because that was a framing, an awful lot of the comments um, were, were reflecting that kind of um, discourse as well, you know, seemed to be endorsing it broadly. Um, the Sun and the Times were really interesting. Um, because on their threads, and this was quite prominent in some areas on Twitter as well, but particularly on the Southern, Southern Times threads, their main Brexit night and election night coverage framed the results as kind of popular uprisings that were much wider coalitions were beyond it. They didn't focus, perhaps as they're not generally so concerned with um, working class groups or people living in poverty or, or, or what have you. Um, they didn't frame these events primarily as being about a massive eruption, uh, popular eruption or backlash by blue collar people, or white working class people, working class people generally, etc. cetera. Um, although that did come in to some extent to their narratives. There was a, there was a sense of a wider a silent majority rising up. So a kind of cross-class coalition almost, sick to death of Nowadays, we'd say, you know, woke liberal elites or whatever it is, you know. Um, so the sort of seeds of the kind of cultural discourse that's become ever more familiar in recent times were very visible in their coverage. And it got, it, it got reflected a lot in the comments. People often self-identifying as being part of this rebellion because they voted for Brexit and all the Tories as well. Um, critical posts um, that did emerge um, on, in various places criticising if, if you like, the left behind, whether they explicitly called them uh, uh, these people left behind or not, um, portray them in one of two ways, generally. They were either duped, misled or exploited, and but they made the wrong decision by voting for Brexit or and all the Tories, or they were back, backward, ignorant, bigoted, you know, so there was a, a sort of you know, an overtly stigmatising dimension to some, some of the critical comments, you know, particularly on Twitter. Um, so just to sort of visualise, and as you can see, um, on The Guardian um, in 2016, there's a huge polarisation, you know, and th- th- there's a massive dominance of comments that seem to be endorsing the broad frame of the article to which they're responding. They're portraying these people as legitimately being sick to death with Labour and the Liberal establishment, even if voting Brexit wasn't necessarily the right thing to do objectively. It was completely legitimate that they felt marginalised, disenfranchised forgotten about, neglected, taken for granted, etc. And on the day of the referendum in The Guardian, those critical, if you like, of the left behind and all the work, the working class and so forth, working class voters, were by far in a mi- minority by comparison. But in the sun, and whether this was down to some trolling that was going on from Guardian Reefs or whatever, it was much closer. So, you know, again, mainly people were endorsing, standing up for, defending those, those people if they took a position and didn't adopt a fairly post something that was indeterminate in terms of its sentiment. Um, but there, there was a closer, you know, it was closer in terms of the number of people who were willing to be critical. Uh, but again, in the Times, as with The, with the Guardian, there's, there's a big gap. Between you know, and, and on the whole, the comments were defending and, and supporting um, uh, the, 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 the people who felt disenfranchised and so on. Although, as I say, the working class, sorry, the left behind imaginary in the Times was a slightly different one, somewhat different one to the Guardian's one, which was very working class focused. Um, interesting when you get to the 2019 election, uh, the Guardian, it's much, it's much closer. So you've got people much more willing to be critical in comments by that point, as if they'd almost become exasperated. The liberal facade of understanding uh, people who they don't agree with, but they kind of understand their predicament historically, seemed to have slipped. And there were more people willing to, on the Guardian's threads to be overtly critical of the left behind and all the working class for voting, particularly for voting conservative at that point. Um, but, you know, as you can see, there's all sorts of other things going on in, in the other places. I'm just conscious of time and how long I've already taken, so I will, I will move on quickly. But there's obviously quite a lot on these slides, and, and I'm happy to share them with everyone if you're interested. Twitter, a much smaller sample, as you can see, 175 um, tweets uh, over the two uh, nights um, that were in any way codable, really, as being coherent, of, you know, not just commenting, wow, what a result or something, but overtly discussing in one way or another the the role in the outcomes played by if you like the left behind the working class voter and so on um and uh, yeah i'm not a visual person and i'm 
<laughs> as I look at this one, I'm struggling to, to think. I mean, clearly, the defending the, le the, the left behind, if you like, is still the dominant uh, picture on the whole. Um, but there's interestingly quite a few sort of neutral looking tweets earlier on. And, and that falls away, I think, as people take a much clearer position by the time of the 2019 election. They're either defending those, those people and standing up for their right to vote the way they are, or even supporting it and identifying with that position themselves, or they are overtly critical of it. Um, and then finally, the final slide, put your misery there. Um, this sort of sums up, hopefully, I think, what I think came out of thematically the analysis from my interview chapter, which is sort of chapter five in the book, I think. Um, the, the people that I spoke to, um, uh, you know, we had lengthy interviews. I mean, most of them were at least an hour, sometimes longer. Sometimes I spoke to people more than once. Um, and obviously I tried to, you know, I carried out a kind of broadly a thematic analysis of the transcripts afterwards. And the thematic analysis was focused particularly, I asked them about all sorts of things. I mean, towards the end of the interviews, I actually directly asked a lot of people what they felt about terms like left behind, you know, whether they identified with these terms, for example, whether they understood or what, you know, whether whether that really meant anything to them, if you like, uh, or whether they would suggest other ways of describing things. But the interview started out as very open ones, mainly asking them about, you know, what their communities were like and what the area that they lived in was like and any changes that they would observed over the years and how they would characterise it and how they would characterise the challenges but the opportunities it, 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 it faced, etc. And I asked them a bit about austerity and things like that as well. In the end, this sort of typology, if you like, or taxonomy typology, I suppose, is, is really the kind of the five key aspects of, if you like, I call them dimensions of left behind us, what a horrible academic term that is, uh, or pseudo-academic term. Um, the five kind of dimensions of, of what it might, how they kind of described what one might broadly see as a sort of left behind attribute. Um, uh, the, the five key themes that emerged, you know, and one of them was this broad one, probably the most prominent, they're kind of broadly in order of prominence, degradation of work, you know, that's my language, precarity, falling wages, long term economic decline of the whole area, but the sort of the nature of the job market as it was now and as, as it had become over time. Disconnection, so it might not surprise you, you know, weak transport links, poor communication, poor Wi Fi, feeling kind of cut off even if they were in an area geographically that really shouldn't have been cut off in any, in any obvious way, but infrastructural problems, erosion of place, all of these things, a lot of these things obviously overlap and often uh, the anecdotes contain aspects of two or three frame, um, themes in them, if you like. So erosion of place, you know, the idea, particularly some of the older people I spoke to did talk about their memories of how different things have been in Stoke-on-Trent when there were all the potbacks there and, and all of that. And one or two of them had worked in one capacity or another in those at some point way back, or their parents had, you know, poor communicate, uh, sorry, and decaying infrastructure. Some of them talked about some of the buildings that were still empty and had just been left to rack and ruin or how they'd been transformed recently into luxury flats, but there was no one there really. And really they needed affordable housing, you know? Uh, and and um, so that, that kind of came in as well. And, and heritage loss, some people did sort of almost overtly allude to that, you know, that they remember times where, because everyone worked in the same industry once, you know, there were, there were lots of kind of cultural dimensions to that, you know, people had shared socializing experiences and various other things, you know. Um, contested identity, Shifting demography was a big part of this, but interestingly, you know, people did bring up immigration from time to time. You know, they did, and they did talk about people coming in from other countries as well as other areas of the country, but um, but not not that much. You know, it did come up; it was definitely there. But some of the demographic things that people volunteered more readily were that younger people moving away or, or people or being inclined to, even if they hadn't moved away, be thinking about that because there might be more opportunities elsewhere. That one, one woman talking about her son, you know, she was going to encourage her son to move away when he got old enough because there just wasn't enough in the area around Stoke-on-Trent anymore to give him proper opportunities. And it would break her heart, but, but she really felt for his own good, he needed to do that, you know. Um, so that was kind of interesting. And some of that did morph into change broadly speaking, what you might 
uh, considered to be kind of cultural change aspects. But as I say, that wasn't all down to sort of foreign immigrants moving in or en masse or anything like that. Although occasionally that, that kind of issue was brought up. Um, and finally, demographic, uh, democratic, um, democratic deficit. So that's the sort of political marginalization aspect of things. Feeling unheard, invisible, ignored, forgotten. Interestingly, there's been some evidence from other recent research that this is quite commonplace when you sort of drill down in, in some um, inverted commas left behind communities to why people feel the way that they do or, or and sometimes why, the, why they vote the way that they do. I think there's some of this in Deborah Matterson's Beyond the Red Wall, actually. Um, they sometimes when people were talking about politicians not listening and things, you kind of probed a bit more and and, you know, not caring about their area and so on. When you when you kind of probed, it turned, they were talking as much about their own local council as they were about even regional, let alone national or international or European politicians or political elites. So that was kind of really interesting as well. So it's about almost distant behaviour, um, people ignoring them and neglecting them, who were much located actually in quite close proximity to them. They were their own district council or their own county council or whatever, you know. But their ward, their local immediate neighbourhood, they felt was often left out of the conversation and left out when the funding was allocated and so forth. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of it. And I'd say, yeah, just as sort of one of the key points, I think, to emerge that I kind of emphasise a bit in the conclusion of the book is economistic or economic concerns. Um, in the end, I would say vastly trumped kind of culturalist ones, you know, kind of culture war type um, issues, the things that got people most exercised and they most enthusiastically or, or you know, um, most sort of depressively talked about at length were you know problems with buses and wi-fi and poor housing or lack of housing things like that lack of opportunities um poorly paid work etc um and so it kind of sharpened my sense in the end that whatever the outward manifestations i think the underlying drivers of so much of what what is often labeled um, problematically left behind the left behind condition if you like are, are primarily socioeconomic and there you have it. <laughs> um, and that's it, hours, didn't it? Sorry about that. Um. No, thank you, James. It's good I said 15 minutes and no more, Emily, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew you would talk for a while. I know, so I know. It takes the pressure off me asking too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks, so, yeah, I think, thank you for giving us that kind of overview. There's so much packed into the book, actually that when I was reading, I didn't manage to read the whole thing, but when I was reading through, I, there was so much popping up that I thought um, that kind of, it just provoked lots of um, ways to approach this. So first, I just wanted to ask you um, in terms of this concept of the left behind, in, you know, it kind of almost deletes any sense of agency there. So who is, who is, who is doing the leaving? Um, and I just wondered, I know you talk about that in the book, so I wondered yeah. if you could kind of, reflect on that and kind of also maybe think how, did your participants talk about who they felt left behind by yeah it's a really good point and so I suppose when your kind of starting point is at least partly that that it's a problematic because I mean all labels are problematic to some extent aren't they but but this one is quite an abject label in some ways you know it's there is an issue as you, I think you just use the word agency you know you're automatically sort of suggesting that there's a sort of uh, however well-meaningly sometimes that term has been used, um, well how, however well-intentioned, if patronising um, the usage it sometimes is, um, there is an implicit sense there's a lack of agency there, that people have, have kind of fallen behind somehow. They've not just been left behind, they've kind of almost left themselves behind or whatever, you know. Um, but so, yes, who, who is doing the leaving behind is kind of in, intrinsic to a lot in the book and uh, a, lot, a lot of the stuff I'm trying to wrestle with. And, um, and I mean, I suppose in very simple terms, although I don't like the term left behind, um, I, and we were talking about this before, weren't we? I would say, and wouldn't we all, wouldn't a lot of us say this, that the sort of neoliberal forces of the last 40, 50 years, particularly, um, and in the UK, particularly the Conservative Party, have had successive governments have 
you know, inverted commas left behind or certainly neglected and about, particularly when we're talking about the post-industrial working class, but post-industrial areas and communities. But actually, actually, sorry, I say particularly, no, virtually all of the groups that, that, that I try to talk about, like all, lots of other groups that might legitimately lay claim um, if they wanted to, to being to, to being recognised as having been left behind, long-term unemployed people, wherever they are, people in precarious work, wherever they are, people with long-term disabilities are forced to navigate an awful, um, you know, punitive benefit system and so on. Uh, and a lot of a lot of migrants and refugees and so forth as well, you know. Um, I mean, all of these groups, in one way or another, I would say, have been neglected and, and, uh, and often um, discursively exploited in really quite invidious ways by forces on the political right, particularly, I, I would argue. But then I'm obviously very politically biased, but I would, I, I would say that, you know, just follow a lot of the, the money, as it were, or lack of, you know, you can see the, de the mass deindustrialization, obviously, of the early 80s is the most obvious explosive thing in the last 30, 40 years, which, which then followed with years and years and years of neglect, including under New Labour to some extent, you know, uh, lack of investment in, in um, you know, by government, particularly in creating new opportunities of a decent quality on scale, which was what was needed, has, has, has led to the economic, has worsened and exacerbated and deepened the, um, the economic conditions that I think have, have given rise to some of the political explosions and some of the cultural expressions if you like, culture war expressions of recent times, you know, and, and have been, have, have allowed, you know, have led to the sort of exploitation of all of those currents, again, by populist forces particularly. So, yeah, so leaving behind, I would largely lay, lay blame at the feet of certain political and economic forces, which probably don't leave a surprise, but I do agree, it's deeply problematic. When I asked the people about what they felt about the term left behind. I did touch on this actually in my PSA presentation, I think, for anyone who had to sit through that a few months ago. Um, some of them did recognize the term, and some of them brought it up themselves actually, although mainly I kind of had to later on in the, in, in the interview kind of introduce it and ask them what they thought of it and how did they recognize it? Does it mean anything to them or whatever? And quite a few of them did up to a point, but then often they processed it out loud as they were reflecting on it, you know? And so they did recognize it, but then they said, but I don't really, but on the other hand, he was doing the leaving behind and, you know, I don't really like to be thought of as left behind. And it almost suggests we left ourselves behind and we haven't, you know, things have been done to us or, or, or not done to us in some cases, you know? So, um, so yeah, I mean, it was an interesting picture, you know, what, 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 what emerged from this. I mean, with those who did engage with it, whether they liked the term or not, I think broadly, they might have probably phrased it very differently to me, you know, but but um, they they did pinpoint some of the some of the obvious forces as well as as well as also laying into their local council quite often. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting, particularly in the sections where you analyse the Hansard discourse around certain Labour MPs yeah. saying that the Labour Party had left people behind. And that seemed to be a very prominent discourse on the left, whereas the right were kind of keeping very quiet about who was to blame yeah. um, for these things. Brilliant. So I just wanted to also ask you about Brexit. So obviously you say very pointedly in the introduction that this book is not about Brexit, um, but, you know, it's kind of frames your sampling strategy a bit, doesn't it, in terms of um, the key areas that you've chosen. Um, so I wondered if you feel like Brexit has brought this more to the, these sorts of discussions more to the fore or whether you think, you know, it would be different had Brexit not happened or if, you know, if you'd looked at this kind of 10 years earlier or even, you know, now in the kind of post Brexit period. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. I think Brexit undoubtedly and obviously the subsequent elections that we've had and various other sort of episodes since have um, acted as sort of lightning rods, if you like. They've kind of um, sensitised everyone again to, all, including, of course, the commentary itself, but the media political commentary itself and academia um, to all of these issues. But it, they've certainly, you know, it, they are these sorts of opportunities exploited by, and of course, in the case of Brexit, it was the outcome really of a long-term campaign by, by the populist right, wasn't it, by, uh, led by UKIP. Um, um, to bring bring about the the referendum in the first place, so I think it's absolutely the case that um, that things might have been different. I think in terms of the the um, 
proliferation of discourse about the left behind if we hadn't had those episodes and perhaps it would never have been popularized in the same to the same extent and it's or perhaps it's um it's um sort of um its ability to renew itself and it's it's um yeah, it's, its resilience would, would have been weaker if we hadn't had the subsequent events that we've had as well as succession of Tory leadership um, campaigns and elections and so on since. But, but um, um, I mean, it was, you know, obviously the, there's nothing new about the term left behind. I mean, it goes back generations, you know, like many, many other terms, you know, um, and I try to sort of look at that in chapter two particularly, but, um, but it was definitely in the, in the, you, yeah, you make the point about Brexit. My, my publisher was very, very keen because they were, I think, somewhat naively convinced that Brexit would be ancient history by the time the book came out. No one would ever be talking about Brexit anymore. Um, but of course, and that was before COVID. And of course, now that COVID sort of slowly faded, touch wood, um, Brexit still hasn't gone away, has it? I mean, we're not talking about rerunning it now so much. But the, the ongoing medium to long term ramifications of it in Northern Ireland are very much there. It's still in the discourse. And once we get through, have, you know, again, touch wood, the cost of living crisis and the Ukraine war, it'll probably still be lingering, right, in one way or another. So it was very hard in reality, particularly with the sampling, because, as you say, it sensitised things, it amplified the discourse around the left behind and so forth. It was very hard to construct sampling uh, samples that weren't on the whole unfortunately you know um, clustered around key moments really in the life cycle of the Brexit referendum and its aftermath so you're right in the end I think Brexit ended up probably being the, the most commonly used term even more than the phrase left behind in the book but uh, yeah. Well I think it was just one of those times where uh, as I think you do argue in the book that you know it's a time where these people became yeah. so that's it. politicians whether they wanted to blame them or whether they wanted to co-opt them as this kind of support that's right Appro oh, yeah, kind of appropriate ask... yeah exactly yeah i'm just gonna ask one more question and then sure. i'm gonna seek contributions from the floor so get your questions ready everyone either in the chat or uh feel free to switch your cameras on and stuff so i just wanted to ask about um and i think this might be use particularly useful for our early career colleagues who might be in the zoom or watching this afterwards thinking about your own position as a researcher, researching people who are marginalised or, you know, have, have been, you know, disadvantaged in various different ways. You know, I think actually that's one of the strengths of the book is that you kind of look at this in a very multifaceted way. And that must have been very difficult in terms of gaining those interviews. I just wondered, you know, as a researcher, how you approach, you know, because you don't want to unwittingly re re produce what some of these kind of elite discourses are saying but at the same time you need to be kind of um relatively um analytical and kind of critical so I just wondered how you kind of approach that and whether you had any difficulties there yeah it's a, it's a really good question I mean it is really difficult because I mean in chapter two particularly when I'm sort of looking at the evolution of sort of stigmatizing discourses around the working class or, or people living in poverty or people suffering economic disadvantage which I did really heavily in the previous book obviously um, and I talk a lot about kind of orientalizing or othering you know whether intentionally you know whether intentionally or unintentionally because even some of those but even some of the Victorian social explorers if you like were however condescendingly were kind of motivated by some kind of compassion in some respects at least you know Although a lot of them are deeply, deeply problematic, um, so you don't you don't want to be kind of repeating that, you know, in the present day. You've got to, you know, I was very conscious of it, and uh, I was probably even more conscious of it. I think when I was trying to approach groups that were because I was, as you say, I was trying to make sure I wasn't just playing into the stereotypical white working class imaginary. So a, a lot of the the strongest and most important critiques of the terminology of the left behind have been made by critical race scholars, for example. So, you know, pointing out absolutely that, that we have a very multicultural, multi-ethnic working class. And in fact, in a lot of the post-industrial areas even that are often wheeled out as emblematic of sort of post-industrial Northern England or whatever, you know, actually they've been multi-ethnic and multi multicultural for many, many years. And people used to, even in some of those old industries, were working side by side who were, were not homogeneously white working class. So I think I was particularly acutely aware when I was approaching groups representing um, 
uh, you know, the, the Bain community, for example, and, or communities and so forth, you know, that, that I really wanted, because it was, it, was it was a sensitive enough issue around economic disadvantage, but when there's inter intersectional disadvantages as well, you, you, the, the, the things that you've not experienced yourself um, and can't speak from in any way from personal experience of it, you've really got to be very, very sensitive about this. So obviously I used all the usual consent forms and everything as well, everyone who was interviewed, the vast majority of whom, unless they were in a position of authority and gave explicit consent to be named, because they could easily be identified anyway, the vast majority of people were anonymous. Um, and I, so I had, I, I went through all the usual procedures with all that as well. Um, but you're right, I mean, I was, I was very aware of it. Sometimes in an individual interview situation as well, particular issues came up and you, you kind of think, oh, I don't know whether I should be pressing them anymore on that. Or maybe afterwards we'll, we'll have another chat after the recording's done about, you know, maybe another time, you know, are you okay for me to still to go into some of that? Because it is interesting, but I don't, that it, you know, this is even if they were anonymized kind of thing, you know. And the same with sort of people with disabilities and things. I mean, particularly for the Scottish project, some of these people's voices do end up directly or indirectly in the book, as well as in a journal article I've just written based on that particular project. And um, again, you know, I don't have experience of those of those physical disabilities, for example, myself, or, or most of the illnesses that we have, or being a full time carer or, or whatever, you know. So. Uh, and there were refugees I spoke to as well, you know, who, who'd been through horrendous traumas. And, and so, yeah, um, I mean, it's a, it's a hard one to answer. I've just been a bit elliptical there. I know so I was very conscious of it as I was trying to be, make sure I was con conscious of it, really, you know, and just being as ethical as I could be in the process itself. And then also before I actually put things to, to paper, kind of double checking if I wasn't sure about anything, really. With them because often, often sometimes you know much after the event you know in terms of um, giving the interview people might have reflected on something and actually thought you know well maybe maybe i'd rather not that that didn't go in print or whatever um but you're absolutely right you, you need to be really aware of this and i was i just felt i had a responsibility on the one hand without wanting to sound patronizing saying that to try to get some of those voices out there because i don't think there's enough of it particularly of the multi the much more multifarious you know, forms that economic and intersectional disadvantage actually takes in the real world. But at the same time, in trying to do that, you've just got to tread very carefully, and you should do. You know, I think that is really important that you've got people's actual voices in there because it kind of, well, it just shows the kind of diversity of experience yeah. uh, and everything. Brilliant. So I've got, we've got about 15 minutes. James has to rush off um, on, pretty much on time. So if, has, does anyone have any questions or want to come in? Feel free to add them to the chat and I'll read them out. Oh, Lerma's got her hand up. Hi, I'm sorry I can't turn my video on. I, I don't know why yeah. it doesn't, it just doesn't work on, t on Zoom. It works on Teams anyway. Um, <laughs> it was really interesting. Thanks, James. Um, I was wondering if you found any kind of, um, divisions within or imagined divisions within the group of left behind sort of between liberal and illiberal or populist anti-populist groupings of say um i'm sort of imagining that it might happen between sort of uh, communities that are disadvantaged because of ethnicity uh uh disability and that kind of thing and those who are white working class um and and of to do with the reasons behind why they are left behind. So because there's some kind of, some are seen as, as deserving of positive discrimination or, um, or because they experience structural inequalities uh, while others don't, even if they do. Um, you know what I mean? That in the discourse yeah. that that's prominent in liberal discourse and might be reacted against among some communities. Did you, did you get a sense of any of that? Yeah, I think I did. I mean, I don't think so much. I'm just trying to think about it. I mean, I think some some of it might have come through some of the interviews as well, actually. Just to, I mean, obviously, some of some of those um, kind of qual qualities or attributes of, again, I hate to use the term left behind, but being left behind, if you like, or suffering disadvantage or inequality overlap you know so in one individual you know you you can have disability and um be a person of color and you know but actually live in a post-industrial area despite the stereotypes that suggest it's all white working class so you kept so that complexity came out particularly through some of the interviews i think you know um 
and that uh, you often get this when you do research obviously with people's live realities it, it really heavily questions the popular stereotypes and i kind of half expected that but i think maybe i was surprised by the extent to which it was it, it was much more much much more nuanced and complicated in reality um that that there there were not always clear-cut divisions between these different forms of disadvantage or you know inequality and, and they often coexisted in a single person or certainly within single, the same communities and so on but I, I i going on that wider point that point about so certainly in the discourse that i analyzed absolutely lots of evidence of um, particular groups being considered to be sort of more deserving uh, than others um, and sometimes by almost a mission um, there are groups that are kind of excluded from um, uh, articles or political speeches that seem that ostensibly are standing up for left behind groups or whatever um, and that can be hugely problematic whether that's sort of uh, main groups or um, un unemployed people, particularly in normal, you know, hugely, you know, almost invariably, I find left out of um, discourses about um, um, people being unfairly, you know, economically disadvantaged in structurally or in any other way. Um, so even, you know, even people who often are ostensibly spokespeople for poverty groups in some cases, though they're less guilty than politicians. Um, and newspapers of the left, ostensibly, will will often uh, omit from narratives or op-eds or whatever it is that they run uh, that are sort of standing up for, for particular economically disadvantaged groups or leave out certain groups like long-term unemployed people or whatever, you know, almost as if they're embarrassed to try to defend those groups, you know, or that it's almost a norm normative given that, um, that, that, that there is there are some people who just are a bit undeserving in some way, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there were there's a huge amount in uh, there's just so much problematic discourse I looked at it, both particularly in the press, I would say, but also in in the parliamentary um, extracts I, I looked at at some points, um, you know, where people, um, you know, were saying, you know, some articles just overtly racist, for example, you know, I mean, I would say they're completely racist, you know, just as there were some that are extremely socially stigmatizing um, towards other other groups, you know. Um, like the unemployed or whatever. So, sorry, I know I probably not entirely answered your question, but 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 everything you just said, I recognised bits of that absolutely from from what I found, and I hope I've explored a lot of that. I've tried to explore a lot of it somewhere in the book at least. Um, I've just noticed there's a big question in from Fran actually on the chat as well. Can I answer that one? Um, yeah, I was going to say, can you read it out for the yeah, video yeah. and then it answer says, it? <laughs> no, that's fine. It says, my question is in relation to neoliberal ideas on meritocracy and a perhaps a refusal by, refusal by the left behind, in inverted commas, to own that neoliberal dialogue, that if you don't get on, it's your own fault. Uh, we saw um, post-GFC uh, that the public and public sector encouraged to, uh, to take fault for being profligate, which sort of worked. But um, not for those with no more to cut back on, kind of thing. Um, so let me just go over this again. Sorry, that was me. I, I'm quite happy. Sorry, to... <laughs> sorry. I just sorry, 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 I think I know what you mean. Sort of... Global financial <laughs> crisis. Sorry. Global financial crisis. That's it. Yeah. Sure. I, I did some work on this um, a few years ago on the discourses. So I, I loved your sure. um, newspaper discourses on left and right wing. Um, media discourses of yeah, the global yeah, financial yeah, crisis yeah, so yeah. almost your work seems to lift where i stopped um yeah. in terms of that and and what we saw at the end of the financial crisis was this whole but it's your fault you've got no money yeah, you know yeah. you've spent too much you've taken on these yeah. big loans you were blah blah, yeah. blah and i think yeah. the middle classes were encouraged for want of a better word to adopt that yeah it's our fault we, we overdid yeah, it yeah but i'm yeah. wondering having listened to you whether yeah. people who did not have access to those middle class benefits pre-financial crisis are like, well i'm not taking this yeah. and, and, and having had 30 years of education of kind of meritocracy allegedly which which we all know is is an absolute fallacy there is no you know sure sure it's like um, American dream is there yeah, yeah exactly it's it's a really awful insidious kind of if you don't get on it's your own fault and i just thought have we actually got to the point where these people who are are just i'm not accepting any of your frameworks for me and i just wondered if you'd seen any of that kind of a rejection of neoliberalism itself 
Yeah, it's a really, really interesting point, isn't it? And, and in a way, you made me think, you know, for a second about maybe there's some element of truth in in the kind of, if you like, the popular backlash stuff by people, you know, not, not the silent majority that's a cross-class coalition idea, but the, but the, the people who are economically disadvantaged, who the, the, those among those demographics who, who did vote for Brexit or, or whatever it is, maybe, maybe there's some element of a kind of backlash against that kind of, you know, um, that kind of post-crash sort of uh, discourse that you're talking about in a, in a way you know maybe there is almost something there but, but I, I think um i was just I struck think... with the org sorry i'm uh, with the auger report and that whole yeah these are communities who've not had a yeah, breath yeah. of fresh air in 10 years that's right yeah i'm just so tr sorry sorry i interrupted you there. no no no, no you're, the, people did own a, um who i interviewed um without much prompting a lot about austerity the word austerity came up a lot which obviously is a very post-crash term isn't it and you know it almost seems like old hat now but of course it's not you know we're living all of the other crises in very commas that we we're experiencing now we've experienced the last few years covid and everything has been and the cost of the drink crisis has been exacerbated a hundredfold by the fact that public services the nhs and nothing was equipped to deal with crises as and when they came because of austerity haven't they or at least partly because of austerity so um but yeah it did you know even in the kind of post austerity you know, early johnson sort of uh, boosterism periods when i was carrying out the interviews albeit under covid conditions people were bringing up austerity and, and all of those things a hell of a lot and there was a sense that a lot of the people i spoke to weren't overtly directing blame to other groups or other people or anything they were much more measured than that and thoughtful and reflective, but they did the things they talked about that led to my sort of thematic list <coughs> were very much austerity related a lot, of, a lot of the time in many ways, as well as, of course, about the industrialization generally over a longer period and, and so on. And they often used that term. They often said, oh, just, you, just, you can't can't get an appointment with the doctor, it's impossible. And even if they also talked a bit about immigrants, they didn't really blame it on on the immigrants particularly it was just you can't get a point because there aren't enough doctors and, and it's got worse over the years recently particularly because of austerity but I, I know what you mean they weren't the people who had access to the massive loans and things generally anyway i mean people did people with modest means did get mortgage to the hill and stuff i suppose but but um a lot of these people are obviously rented accommodation and things they've never been in line for a mortgage anyway you know um so it's a really good point i'll have to have a look at that I'll have to have a look at your work now, more directly, <laughs> more in more detail. <laughs> oh, thanks. We, we love bringing researchers together at the MPG. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Oh, just like, of, course Mike, of course, Mike Berry's done his big, did his big book as well, than me about you know all, all of that discourse, the post crash discourse and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've got we've got a couple of minutes, so I want to bring Tom in, who's been waiting very patiently Sorry, to ask. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. Um, thank you for a, a really fabulous presentation. Um, as a as a northerner myself, um, it's always good to uh, have more uh, books in which northerners on the subject matter. Um, so my question is more of a, an invitation to speculate. Um, obviously, we saw from your work that the left behind framing became the almost the dominant explainer for why Brexit existed. Uh, why it happened, why the 2019 general election was went the way that it did. Um, to me, as, as a Northern, it's always struck me as quite surprising, given that mathematically it doesn't quite make sense, right? The votes of a few thousand people and a few select constituencies in the North mean nothing without the home counties voting the other way. Um, so I would be incredibly interested to hear your thoughts as to why this narrative stuck as well as it did, why it became the dominant framing. Um, who does that benefit? What is it What is it for that we focus on um, the notion of the left behind? Thank you. No, it's a really good question. I, th I think in simple terms, it kind of stuck because of a kind of that all too familiar and horrible alliance that almost organically seemed to emerge between the sort of the right wing press particularly and and the political right on the whole um, and, and the populist right really, you know, uh, played into this and played it up and, and um, magnified it. And I think so. So I think it, it's the political economy 
really situation in the UK at national level at least I think is UK wide national level particularly is I think why it ended up being able to stick as it, and, it, and this I think also it's just such a simplistic easy to grasp narrative surprising though it might have seemed very initially particularly the kind of apparent mass defection supposedly overnight though of course not overnight uh, to, to the Tories in 2019 you know um, the whole Red Bull um, phenomenon which is also hugely exaggerated and, and the reality of what happened that night was much much more complicated as we've subsequently discovered through really interesting work by academics and sophologists so I think I, I suppose it, simple narratives stick quite easily don't they and i think you know and particularly if they're endlessly repeated by an alliance of 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 you know national newspapers politicians you know including the governing party or many of many of the leading lights in the governing party for, for the last decade or more um in whose interest it is to promote those narratives you know and drown out other ones and you know of course it can all be amplified these days through social media and other means as well um in ways that weren't possible before so I, I think it's it's a bit of a trite answer, but I think the the easiness and the simplicity, the easiness, to, readiness to grasp of it, and the fact that it was so endlessly repeated by the sort of alliance, sort of Chomsky and alliance um, of um, in our political economy. But but um, but I think you, you're dead right. All of these, both of those two electoral events or democratic events were vastly more complicated than they were initially portrayed in terms of who was responsible, so to speak, in terms of voting this, this way and the other and delivering the results the way they went. And, you know, there's been lots of really interesting work into the role of the so-called squeeze middle again, um, in uh, so relatively uh, declining people in terms of their economic circumstances, but by no means poor, by no means ticking the classic you know the classic stereotypical left behind boxes other than perhaps the parts of the country they live in in some cases um and there's been lots and lots of work you know the, the red wall is, is just a quite literally a rhetorical construct isn't it i mean it's you know it's a much it's a real patchwork phenomenon you know it, it isn't just a, a, a homogenous grouping of constituencies that had always been forever labor voting you know with overwhelming majority it's just not true it encompasses a lot of constituencies that have always been floating you know swing seats that tend to go this way or the other like Manhattan or whatever you know depending on which governing parties in power at the time or uh, the incumbent government at the time of the election so so you know it, all you know all of these sorts of phenomena are as we know uh, doing what we do much more complex than they're often painted and and their causes are too and so I probably haven't answered your question slide but I completely recognize again as I said to Brad at the previous question absolutely everything you just said and I think I have tried in the book to have a go at that one as well um so hopefully yeah, I'm quite critical of the Red Bull discourse so anyway hopefully hopefully there's something in an earlier chapter on that one okay well it looks like we've raced all the way to five o'clock if there's anyone who's got any last quick questions we might be able to squeeze one in no one's putting a hand up Okay, well, thank you very much, James, for thank joining you. us to talk about your work. And thank you, everyone, for your contributions. And uh, we'll see you again, hopefully, at another MPG seminar. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. It was really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.